everybody. Welcome to a special Saturday stream. What is Good UX? And then it's going to be a Q and A. I've got Olivia the dog with me, who can't seem to decide if she wants to sit with me or not. I, once I started talking, she did not want to sit with me. Hey, Kayleen. Um, so this is a special event that I am doing for the DIA Design Guild uh, Mentorship and Apprenticeship Program. Uh, we are going to do a little talk about what is good UX. I'm going to be taking your questions about good UX. I'm going to turn my fan on. Let me know if the sound is bothering you. But of course, first... Thanks to everybody who has been joining our new Patreon. Um, hi, Malika. Uh, so happy to have everybody joining our Patreon. We've got about 40 people already, and uh, we'd love to add you too. So you can join for free, or you can do a paid membership where you get some early access and special perks. Uh, so check it out. Um, so as I was saying, today is what is good UX, and I'm going to start with some questions I got ahead of time, then I'm going to do a couple of slides, and then we'll come back to your questions. If you have questions, just put them in the live chat here on YouTube or on LinkedIn, and I will be taking your questions there. And hello to my husband, Pierre Mario, who is like 20 feet that way. Uh, okay, so uh, we the first question I got ahead of time is, what's UX versus what's UI? Um, there's d some different definitions here, but the definitions that I go by is that user experience, UX, and user interface, UI, used to mean nearly the same thing, but I'm talking like 10 or more years ago. Over time, that definition has changed. Now, when we talk about the UI, we're typically talking about the visual design, the look, the branding, the color, the typography, maybe the mood. Um, this could come from a design system. It could come from a visual designer making a page by hand. So usually the UI has to do more with the aesthetics of something. The UX of something would have more to do with the um, layout, the interactivity, the functionality. This could be a digital experience. It could be a non-digital experience. A lot of people think UX is just for digital, but I believe in that broader definition where CX and UX are pretty much the same thing. So when someone says they are a UI UX designer, I normally assume they're more of a visual designer and maybe they know a little bit about UX. If someone says they are a UX designer, I normally assume that they are more of an information architect and interaction designer who really thinks about uh, processes and um, the, the user, of course, and uh, let me set up some other things here, um, and, and how we can make things better for people regardless of what the aesthetics or, or colors end up being. So that is a short version on that one. Another question I got ahead of time was, what about heuristic evaluations? Is that good UX? So someone who is um, getting really good at UX, you might not be an expert yet, but you might be becoming quite good at it, might say, let's do a heuristic evaluation of a website or app or other digital experience. And certainly these are standards by which we can uh, examine an existing design or system. And we can say, does this seem to meet these standards? Where does this not meet these standards or break these standards? And then we can certainly suggest room for improvement. But remember, even if something hypothetically passed those standards of the typical 10 heuristics from Nielsen Norman Group, or if you're using another paradigm, it still doesn't mean it's a great user experience. It just means that you haven't found some of the worst offensive things that made us build a heuristic standard. So uh, I would say heuristics are certainly a set of things that we can look at. But when I do my audits and over on our new channel, CXCC, this is the Delta CX channel. On YouTube, we also 
also have a new channel called Customer Experience, Customer Centricity, so subscribe there also. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we're doing CX audits on some Mondays, and so we're taking a look at a site or app or other experience, and we're looking at uh, all of the aspects of it and the touch points, not just does it look nice or does it seem to be branded well? Uh, but we're also looking at some accessibility things. We're looking at uh, some content things. So uh, you can check those out. We're we've started doing them. I think we've done two or three. There's a whole playlist over on CX-CC with those. Anmol says, is it possible to evaluate any website or mobile site only on the basis of heuristic principles? You can, but I think you'll be missing a lot. I think you'll be missing a lot about accessibility, about content, about information architecture, about whether or not it really solves a problem. We can have a nice looking website or mobile app or mobile site that passes Nielsen Norman's heuristics, but does it have the right information? Did it solve our original problem? Did we understand our original problem? What do we know about our users? So I would say don't stop at your heuristics. Heuristics are great to know and good to know how to do a heuristic audit. But as I've said at my company, Delta CX, we've expanded beyond that. And when we do an audit or assessment, we go beyond the uh, typical heuristics to try to really look more at experiences. Can you check my website? No. Not during this show. I was requested to do this show by the DIA Design Guild in order to um, help the mentors and apprentices in that guild better understand what is good UX. I think if you would like a website review, you uh, probably want to send that to me in some other form. Sorry about that. Um, so let me see what other questions we got ahead of time. What's the difference between ideal UX and final UX? Well, first of all, I think UX really never feels final. It always feels like, okay, we're done for now. We've done as much as we can do with the time that we have and the problem we're trying to solve. It never really feels final. There's always something else it could be or do. There's always more work we would like to do on it and we usually don't have time. So typically we do have to finalize it in some way so that it can move through the process where we work. It might have to go to engineers or other people. So we do have to call something final eventually but we know in our hearts let's uh, set off some hearts we know in our hearts it's never really final and we would usually like to revisit it again or continue working on it even after it's gone out to uh, the public so we might imagine an ideal user experience, but that changes over time. Maybe what's ideal now is different next year when technology changes, the environment, uh, the environment changes, the, I meant the economy changes, people change. So to me, we might call it final for the purposes of a project, but I think to many of us, it's never really final. And how ideal it can be is really going to be up to our project and how much time they, they give us to do good work. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that when I switch over to slides. So uh, how do we determine uh, good UX? I've put together some slides on that. So let's do this. And welcome to Slideland. And again, I'm happy to take your questions and comments as I go. I just have a couple of slides. I think I made five or something like that. So when we think, oh, that is not working. I've changed slides and you're not seeing it, grr. Oh, thank you for subscribing. Don't forget to subscribe to the other channel too. Give me a moment to try to um, change this up and see if I can get to my slides. Otherwise, we'll have to try a different way. What if I do this? That does not look right. How is my screen not showing my own slides? Uh, okay, uh, let's try something different. I tested this right before we went live. And of course, now I'm live and the slides are sad and not happening. Uh, what if I say this? 
No. Okay, so that's not happening. Let's uh, sneak back to me for a moment while I try to find another way to uh, show my slides. But um, instead of showing you my slides, I will just talk uh, about them a little bit and you'll just uh, miss out on some of the visuals. Apologies there. Um, and I did test this right before the show, so ouch, ouch. Okay, so first we want to talk about what makes a good user experience. A good user experience is going to be easy for that user or customer. And we mean all of them. It can't just be easy for some of them. It's got to be easy for all of them. It's intuitive. It's logical. It makes people want to say, it just works. And your customers and users didn't need help or customer support. It makes them feel efficient. Remember, people are task-based. They're coming to your site or app or system or store to do something. We want to make sure that that is obvious and easy to do and that uh, other than entertainment, where people like to spend a lot of time and they don't care about efficiency, outside of entertainment, people probably want an efficient experience. What about bad UX? Uh, bad UX would be frustrating, confusing, disappointing, distracting. Let's put these guys up. Um, uh, m people making errors and mistakes. Cognitive load, where people feel like they have to think a lot or process information uh, a lot. What about things that have a lot of steps and you feel like you're just working on this forever? It's just going on and on. Um, and how about people going, I, I don't know what to do here. I can't tell what's going on. Typically, when we see these things as we're designing or as we're reviewing somebody else's site with doing that heuristic analysis from the perspective of the user, not necessarily from my perspective, looking for these bad ones, and you can roll the video back once it's on uh, archived on YouTube, and you can write them down. These are things we're looking for. Anything where these could or could be happening or are happening, these are likely bad user experiences. Well, what about great user experiences? What if we go beyond good to great? Well, great user experiences, for starters, they're going to be based on the knowledge of our target audiences. What do we know about our users? On this channel a lot, we like to say people, context, and systems. What, how, what research have we done to make sure that we really understand people, who they are, their tasks, and what they're doing? Great UX then caters to what we've learned rather than trying to change people. I mean, sometimes you're trying to create change, but in general, it's always easier when you cater to who people naturally are and cater to what we've learned will make their tasks better and more efficient and taking people down a clear path. Make it clear, make it easy, make it simple. Great UX should be an easy sell. Your company's salespeople should be able to have an easier time. The marketing department should have an easier time because people will naturally want a great product, a great experience. It sells itself. They'll want to join and they'll want to stay because we're that good. Can you think of any product or service or company in your life that is so good that you are happy to give them your money and you are happy to join or use them and you are happy to stay and be a loyal customer? Uh, if so, throw it in the chat. I want to see who people think of when I say that. Great UX also doesn't require training, books, manuals, videos, tooltips, or instructions. This is a common mistake that I see, especially from newbies in UX. They think that to make the best design, we just have to make something we think will work pretty well and fill it out with instructions and tooltips and uh, introductory tutorials and telling people what's going to happen and what they need to do and, and you know sending them to school. None of us like this when we experience it. Be selfish a moment. You don't love sites and apps and systems that make you sit through training or tutorials or pop-up stuff. So remember, in general, uh, training and tooltips and tutorials and all of that stuff, these are band-aids being put on designs that could be better because designs should be 
easy, intuitive, obvious, all of these things. Once they're not, we're usually putting on a Band-Aid with lessons. So when you catch yourself making tool tips or explanatory text or overlays introducing things to people, ask yourself if the, des the design could be better and clearer. We have to communicate in a plain language to match users' understanding and knowledge. Um, we see this a lot, especially on things like government websites. They're not speaking our language. It's not clear what they're talking about or what we need to do. So great UX is going to communicate to people at the level at which they understand and not leave them feeling like they need a dictionary or a lawyer. And great UX is all about outcomes. We should be asking ourselves, did we solve a real problem? Or did we guess about the user and then guess what they need? Did we consider the customer or the user at all? Or did we only think about how we can manipulate or push them, especially if we're uh, held responsible for achieving business goals, we might think of our users as people we can just push around so that the business accomplishes what they want. Did we win more customers? Again, this product or service or experience should be so great that people are happy to sign on. We, it sells itself. Did we improve customer satisfaction? We'll know this from voice of the customer, which is things like survey scores, social posts, customer support records, maybe even our stock price. So there's many ways to check for customer satisfaction and we should be looking at that. We should also be looking at how the customers define this stuff. How would your user or customer define success with what your company has given them? It might be very different than the time on page or conversion rate that your company might want to track. And did we increase customer retention and loyalty? If we have great products, services, and experiences, customers should stay with us longer without us having to bribe them with $10 off or without doing sneaky things like making it hard to cancel. So remember, great UX is really about the outcomes that we see in those great user experiences. And these were some questions that we can ask ourselves to see if we are headed toward great UX. Now this is where I like to talk about the opposite. And how can we tell that a project we're working on or one that we finished and released to the public is not great UX and might be poor quality or low value in the eyes of our users and customers? For that, I love the cost of poor quality, C-O-P-Q, and it's from Lean Six Sigma. I didn't make it up, which means you can Google it and learn more. But basically, the cost of poor quality says there are a whole bunch of things that cost our company money that are really wastes and failures and things we should be trying to avoid. And these are things that great UX can avoid. For example, failures. What if we put that product or idea out there and it's just wrong for people? Well, we probably wouldn't have gotten that far if we had done a better job with the UX in the first place. What about having to redesign things because they weren't good or doing other rework like engineers having to recode or rebuild something? What about having to test it again, both on the UX side and the engineering side? How about the downtime from all of this? What about morale? It's always kind of sad to build something that people didn't really like or need. Um, and then there's external costs. Those are some of our internal costs that will burn the company's money. We also have external costs that burn the company's money when we have these failures and problems like complaints. Customer support costs us money. It's not free. It costs our company money. And if we create something that costs us uh, money in cleaning up the mistakes, this, is, this should be added to the budget. It's not free. What about the cost of customers trusting us less? That's hard to measure, but it's real and sometimes we can feel it. How about we're making fewer sales or fewer repeat sales? That's a sign that maybe our user experience isn't great. What about bad word of mouth? People think we suck and they want to let everybody know. 
There's also environmental costs. What is a cost when everybody needs a dongle? I've got a dongle right here. Let's see. This is because my new phone doesn't have a headphone jack. So I had to get one of those dongles. But what's the environmental cost of that? Now we're using metals and plastics and resources that, that takes a toll on the environment and it's things we had to pay for and produce and eventually it'll be waste. We should care. That costs money. Uh, repairs, returns and other things. So what are some of the ingredients for success and great UX? And by the way, if you're joining late, put your comments and questions in the uh, chat. I'm watching for those. We are talking about good UX and great UX. Um, so what are the ingredients we need for success? We need research uh, to, pe to research people in context. We need time. Great UX doesn't happen in hours. It sometimes doesn't happen in days. So if your company would rather go fast than be good, you're probably not going to have great UX. We need autonomy. It's not great when at our UX jobs, other domains, product, engineering, marketing, are controlling us. We don't control them. Why are they controlling us? So autonomy is important. How about the space to do our craft well? That's going to be time budget, people, the things that any job needs to be done well. We need it too. We also need respect for our specialization. At many companies, they think UX, that's nothing. It's common sense. It's easy. Um, these are not things we say when we respect something. When we respect something, we know how secretly complicated it can be. Um, you know, playing hockey looks easy, but you know what? It's probably not. Um, and if we respect it, we don't go, yeah, that's easy. I could do that. My kid could do that. My dog could do that. So respect for UX work and specializations in the workplace is important. We also need as an ingredient for success to understand users' problems and their perspectives. We can't just guess about them. We can't make up their problems. We can't imagine their problems. We can't assume their problems. We have to have done the right qualitative research to make sure we understand those problems. Uh, and we have to pay attention to DEI and accessibility. We're not going to have a great UX uh, if we haven't cared about all the people who are going to use it to make sure, sure we researched with them, we tested for them, we designed for them. So uh, more diverse populations and really understanding the big rainbow of people that are in our target audience. Now, unfortunately, at many jobs, we don't get these ingredients for success. We get workshops and everything done by committee. We get disempowered. We get stakeholders coming up with features and just telling us what to design and they don't want our ideas. We're told just make it pretty or we know our users, just do what we're saying. And we get a lot of speed over quality. So that means UX is a job where we are often fighting. There are a lot of battles. There are a lot of times where we might be the only person on the team who sees something or cares about something and we have to decide, do we fight for this? And that's part of what makes UX work really hard. All of those ingredients for success are important and we rarely get all of them. And sometimes we don't get any of them. Uh, let me pause in my slides, which you can't see for a moment to take a look at what Karen is asking. And Karen says, is content a part of UX? When I think about UX, the first thing that comes to mind is fulfilling unmet needs and solving problems. For example, I'm paying for Audible because the content is unique and you can't find it anywhere else. I think it meets my, ne meets my needs regardless of design. Oh, I like that, Amy. Amy says, uh, UX is like hockey. Fights can break out. Yeah, I forgot to put these up on the screen. Very well done. Yeah, so first to ask, uh, answer Karen's question and then go to Anmol's question. So this is my uh, diagram of what human-centered design looks like. Now, it's not linear. It's cyclical. It's fluid. And very often, based on the project and the time and the budget and other factors, we have to decide which of these we're doing, how much of these we're doing, how long it's going to take. So again, this is an 
over oops this is an oversimplified diagram but content is definitely part of it content is part of the user experience we have to decide what does this say what images go with this do the images create a mood do the images convey a message content is part of it will there be videos so content for sure in a site like Audible, Audible is selling content, but they don't have a lot of control over the content. If, if you're listening to my audiobook, uh, of course, if you're listening to my audiobook, oops, too many layers, um, on, um, on Audible, uh, and it's now free on the CXCC YouTube channel, so you don't have to listen to it on Audible. But Audible didn't make that content, I did. So that gets a little bit more complex. Audible is the platform, and your experience is how you use that platform to have content delivered to you. Um, but it's not, the, the content came from somebody else that Audible may or may not have control over. So ultimately the user experience is our early research, content, information architecture, interaction design, testing our ideas and iterating or not iterating because our idea failed spectacularly and we need to go with something else. The visual design, branding, whatever that might be, and of course, monitoring this after it goes out to the public. Um, Anmol said, how should we define creativity in UX? Because nowadays, I'm observing the definition of simple design totally different. I think that where companies uh, aren't trying to make you into a robot order taker, there is a lot of room for creativity. When a company says, look, we know we're building this pink highlighter, so just make us a pink highlighter, there is little room for creativity. You probably have your brand established, someone told you what you're making, and the opportunities for creativity are low. That's often why UX designers or product designers or UX strategists are unhappy in their jobs. They were really hoping to be creative. They were hoping to be problem solvers. And instead, they were told, just make this thing and make it pretty and they're thinking where's my opportunity to really come up with the best solution whatever it might be why are you telling me what the solution is this might be wrong um, that's some of the key areas where I think people would like creativity certainly there's also creativity available to us in visual design there's a lot of places where we can be creative the real question is will our job let us because we should be creative. We should be problem finders and pro. Oh, thank you, Yasin. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the other one, CXCC on YouTube. We have two channels now and we're actually broadcasting there more than here. Um, yeah, thank you for the subscribes. Um, I can't tell which one you're subscribing to. I think I have both overlaid. So, uh, so thank you who, for wherever you're subscribing. Don't forget to subscribe on both YouTube channels. So um, again, how should we define creativity? I'd like to see creativity not just be visual or branding creativity or, or look or feel or mood creativity, but also related to problem finding and problem solving. Um, so I had a couple of more slides, which uh, you can't see, and I feel bad about that. I'll have to figure out a way to uh, do that. Let's, uh, let's see if we can find a different way to do that oops that's not doing it darn it um okay you won't see my slide i'm sorry so my second to last slide says it helps to speak the business's language and it's something we talk a lot about in uh ux sometimes in cx but more in ux what is the business's language well it's not come join my workshop and care about the value of design a lot of people feel like that's time and money we spent without making money. The business cares about money that we made, money that we saved. They care about that more than, everybody say it with me, empathy and delight. And they want to see that money as soon as possible. So we need to be speaking about things that the business cares about because they relate back to money spent, money saved. Things like customer adoption, satisfaction, and retention. Let's talk about company values and how they play into our decisions and guide us in the short and long term. 
Now, we claim we want innovation and disruption, but we only make time to guess and then iterate and make small changes. So we might have to be talking about, did we really want to be innovators or disruptors? Then we need more time, more money. Um, we, we can't just rush out innovation. That's not how you do it. We should be talking about evidence-based decision-making. When our company creates strategies, initiatives, goals, decisions, priorities, what evidence are they using? Are they using a survey where they asked everybody if they want a pink highlighter? Mmm, not so good. That could end up being a bad survey that could end up hurting us later. What is our evidence? How did we get it? Are we sure it's true? Mmm. Um, and we're going to be doing uh, a webinar on Wednesday uh, to talk about the Discovery Phase Knowledge Quadrant, also known as The Quadrant, here on the channel. Check out the links here, cxcc.to slash events. Our events are mostly free. The webinar on Wednesday is totally free. Please sign up. We'd love to have you there. It will be on YouTube two weeks later because uh, we give it to the Patreon paying members first for two weeks, and then it goes live. Uh, it goes uh, publicly on YouTube. But you'll you'll definitely want to join that and check out our other webinars. We've got uh, nearly one a week coming up for the next two and a half months. Um, also remember, we need to talk to uh, business people and business-minded people about risk. How can we better identify risk, mitigate risk, keep our teams from making mistakes and bad decisions, and keep our teams from wasteful things that might hurt the company? So ultimately, if our question is, is our UX good? Is our UX great? The real answer to that question comes from our users. They're ultimately the ones who are going to decide. Our internal team could take a look at a design and go, this is great, we like this. We might do a design. We could look at our Figma file, Sketch file, Axure file, whatever we're using, and we could go, I think this is good. I think this is a good solution. Well, look, congratulations to us, but we don't know, and ultimately we don't decide. If I think something is great, and our real customers and users don't love it and they react badly to it and there are complaints or other problems, who's right? It's not me. Doesn't matter if I liked it or thought it was great or I could be proud of it. But if it didn't work, it didn't work. And we have to have the low ego action hero, low egoness and humility to say, Okay, I thought this was good. Maybe I even had some data that I thought was telling me this was good, but now that it's out there, I don't think it's good. I think we're gonna need to talk about removing it, redoing it, changing it, whatever it might take. Sometimes it takes a change, sometimes it takes a severe and significant redo. So remember that as much as we like to imagine that we are the shepherds or shepherdesses of great UX, Sometimes it's just an opinion until we know, and the customers will decide what's valuable. The users decide. The users decide what works for them. So we must remember to put them at the center. That's why we talk about human-centered, user-centered, customer-centric, um, because we can slap each other on the back all we want and say, this UX looks good. But if the customers don't feel the same way and aren't giving it five stars out of five, congratulations on your confidence. Okay, so that was all of the material that I had prepared, and the rest of it was going to be kind of an open Q&A, uh, especially about good UX. So I would love to see if anybody watching live has any questions. Uh, oh, it looks like there is a question uh, on LinkedIn that for some reason hasn't popped up yet. Um, Yasin says, ah, thanks Roberto. Uh, hey Debbie, been a while since I watched your lives. What's the difference between Delta CX and CC, CX? Yes, right. Um, I don't know why that didn't come up on my system. Sorry about that, but at least we've caught it. So I do have two YouTube channels now and we are moving more stuff to the CXCC channel. The Delta CX channel is going to be a little bit more about the craft of UX, doing the UX work, getting the UX job. 
The other channel is more broadly about customer experiences and customer centricity. That means that while UX is a relevant topic, we're going to be talking more about other things that go into making great customer experiences. That might be engineering. It might be researcher design. It might be business stuff like business strategy. It might be service design. It might be product management, product strategy. So um, this is still a great channel. And of course, we have almost 800 videos in the archive. So if you are looking to learn more about um, UX and doing UX work, check the archives on Delta CX. But for the new channel, we are broadening to make sure that we're not just looking at the craft of UX work and UX jobs, but at that larger arc of um, how, how this ultimately affects our users and customers and what else we can do. So that's why um, Wednesday's uh, uh, webinar is going to be about an exercise we can run to see what don't we know before we rush into a, a hey, thanks, before we rush into a project and make some mistakes. Um, the webinar on the 23rd, um, we're doing them mostly on Wednesdays. The webinar on the 23rd is, hold on, let me check my calendar. Um, we're going to be talking about customer journey maps and how they're usually terrible and how you can tell if the one you're looking at or making is terrible and how you can make them better. So again, is that specific to UX? Not necessarily. Sometimes people in other roles do customer journey mapping and this content's important for them too. On Wednesday the 30th, we're going to be talking about product management with Steve Johnson. These webinars will not be live on YouTube. You have to go to cxcc.to slash events and RSVP. It's totally free. You're not put on a mailing list or anything like that. If you RSVP, you'll get reminded. So that's just a good way to make sure you're there. And these are probably going to be in Google Meet and recorded and put on YouTube later. Um, September uh, 6th, we're going to be talking about um, metrics and how they might influence our product strategy. So again, notice that the things on the other channel in these webinars are much broader than just the craft of UX. I hope that helps and makes some sense. Um, I hope I'm not missing uh, YouTube uh, comments. Am I, am I missing YouTube comments? I better take a look because I was missing this LinkedIn one and that was very sad for me. Uh, let's see. Nope, not, not missing. Okay, so does anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, happy to take those. Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so my time is your time. I'm going to refresh my chat just to see, uh, just to try to make sure that I'm not going to miss what anybody says. Um, so chat ready. Very good. But these have been great questions today. So yeah, especially if you are junior, if you are new to UX, if you are still learning, today is the day to, to ask your questions. And they can be UX questions or they could be outside of uh, UX. But uh, uh, check out the other channel too, uh, because that's where we're putting most of our new stuff. Uh, and subscribe there. So I'll hang out a little bit. You know, we've got 17 minutes left, but I don't want to just sit here with dead air. So uh, let's give it a few more minutes. And if nobody has any questions, uh, we'll wind down. I hope I'm not missing questions. Somebody, let's write something on LinkedIn just to see if it comes up. Okay, good. That's my test comment. Okay. Chat's working again, so that means if you do have a question, I will absolutely see it. Yeah, thanks to people who are joining our um, Slack and Discord communities. Those are free. You can find them at deltacx.com slash links. We have a Delta CX Slack and Discord, which again are more focused on the craft of UX and jobs. And then we have a CXCC Discord, which is more focused on those broader topics. So join the one that interests you. 
Um, okay, someone from LinkedIn has left a comment. Sorry, it's not giving me your name, but it says I'm new to UX, so I'm definitely looking forward to the journey mapping webinar. Awesome. Um, let's see, uh, Shilpa. So yeah, I hope to see you uh, there. And again, that's probably going to, it's going to be in Google Meet. Um, now that Zoom has had a total flame down and I think I am done trusting them. Down in flames, y'all. Oh, thanks for the subscription. Thank you so much to everybody who is subscribing. Um, hey, Hugo's here. How you doing? Happy Saturday. Um, how should we set the qualitative quality criteria for the success of the solution? And how do we measure we met those criteria? Super question and very complex. But I would say in simplest terms, uh, the my criteria for uh, was qual and tell me if I'm on the right track. Are, are you asking about how can we tell that our qualitative research was successful and set us up for the right solution? If that's what you mean, and I'll, I'll change my answer if you tell me that's not. Um, what I normally look at is did the qualitative, qualitative research help us get at the heart of the of the problem did we understand the user better do we understand where's my uh, slide out guy um people context and systems okay i have a little layering problem today but you know what i mean uh do we understand people contexts and systems um and did we write great problem statements that are now the problems that we're going to solve yes that's what you meant great and then we'll get to the next questions um, so one way that we can check, of course, is did we solve the problem? If the problem still exists after we put our design out there or our MVP or our release or our service, then we probably didn't solve it. Now, that doesn't mean the research got it wrong. The research could have been great and someone decided along the way that we're going to ignore the research or we're going to design this other thing. So we have to make sure that we see the difference between when the research gave us great evidence and set us up for success with good understanding of users and their behaviors and tasks and perspectives and unmet needs and when we just didn't use that information. So assuming we used that information, we should see that problem solved and the problem solved well. So uh, there might be uh, lots of different ways that we can measure that qualitatively by doing some more uh, evaluative research where we watch people do that task and see now that that task is better or great or uh, it's got fewer problems or no problems. And there might be metrics that we look at as well. But in addition to the business metrics, let's remember to also look at uh, human metrics. We'll be talking more about that in a future webinar. I probably don't have time to do that whole content here. So know that more on metrics is coming. Uh, Anmol says, could you please share your thoughts on the UX writer versus the UX researcher? How are these two roles different? Um, okay, so let me start by just moving some things around the screen a little bit because we're getting lots of questions in, which is great. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put our questions up um, the way we do it on our Ask Me Anything show. So let me grab this question. And let me put up my little question uh, thing, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, share your thoughts on UX writer versus researcher. So uh, some companies might try to combine these. There's nothing we can do about that. However, these are very different jobs, and, and they should be. A researcher is looking to learn more about people, contexts, and systems, behaviors, perspectives, unmet needs, tasks. A writer is a writer. A content strategist is going to be strategic about all types of content, and very often they are also a writer. So researching and writing are two completely different jobs. If a particular company is combining them, they can certainly try that, but chances are you're not going to be given enough time to do either of them well. So if I were interviewing for that job, I'd have a lot of questions. Um, okay, R for Everything is back. It's been a while. Don't forget to come to our new channel. That's uh, probably why we haven't seen you. Uh, R for Everything says, I feel that UX work that wasn't done correctly is useless. What do you think? Well, you never know. It, it might not be a total loss. But um, yeah, I think in many ways, 
uh, bad UX work or UX work that a company kind of over prescribed or tried to over control can be very wasteful. Um, and I think certainly for us, when we are over manipulated or controlled, we feel useless. We feel like, why am I even here? I wanted to find and solve problems and I'm just being told make a pink highlighter. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, Yasina says, let's uh, copy and paste this question. What do you think about the catchphrase, what users say is not what they actually need? How true is that? Um, yes, I think there is a lot of truth to that. Um, a, a user might say, you know, I need a pink highlighter. But what if they need a green highlighter? What if they need a pen? What if they need a, a can of spray paint? What if they need something else? So uh, very often, users and customers are not good at understanding their own problems. They usually just know, look, I'm just trying to get something done. And, and maybe the thing that'll help me get it done better is this pink highlighter. But that doesn't mean that they've correctly understood their problem and that they've come up with the best solution for themselves or for the general population that your company is trying to appeal to. So that's a, another reason why um, asking people what they need can send companies down the wrong path. There have been many public stories about companies that ask users, hey, what do you need? What are we missing? What would you like? And then they go and build that. And then there's the meeting where we all go, what happened here? Uh, we made the thing that everybody said they wanted, or we made the thing that two guys said they wanted. And People don't seem to like it. What did we do wrong? And again, it's because the research they did was more, hi, what do you want? Can you figure out your own problem and solve it? Rather than the good qualitative CX and UX research that would help us better understand what might work best for people. Happy Saturday to Cherish, who is here. Always good to see you. Let's put your question up. What can be done if customer attrition is lower than ever? So customers are not leaving, they're, they're staying more than ever. Business says numbers are good, but customers say they're having bad experiences. How can I influence business decisions? Usually you do have to find something that is on fire that the business cares about. Um, are, and, and first of all, is this data true? Is the data true that business numbers are good. Can we go talk to the sales team? Can we go talk to the customer support team and find out, um, are we up in new customers? Are we up in subscriptions? Are we up in people renewing those subscriptions? Um, I want to make sure that the, these numbers truly are up and this is not just internal crap that we're saying to try to make ourselves feel good because sometimes these things aren't true. What about satisfaction scores? Have we run an NPS? Have we run any survey satisfaction? And not just after they're dealing with customer support, the fact that they had to deal with customer support says that something wasn't right. So. The question would be, what does your company care about? If they don't care about users are having problems, as we so often see, what do they care about? It's usually money and it's usually the time spent to make that money. Um, so that would be the question of what do we know about what this business cares about? And can we have some internal conversations to find out how these things are going? Because we might find that sales is missing their target. We might find that customer support is overwhelmed with complaints and problems and installation issues and people who threaten to cancel and so on. So uh, we have to find a way, excuse me, we have to find a way to show why there needs to be change. Um, that's why in my book in chapter 18, I teach the um, impact map, which we're gonna do as a webinar, uh, I think in September or October. So check the webinar series for that. Um, but if you have my book, it's chapter uh, 18, I think has the impact map. That can help you take something that is affecting users and tie it back to business impact to hopefully make someone care. 
Uh, Cherry says, I get a lot of unhappy customers are most mostly likely to write comments and reviews, but overall our surveys say they're satisfied. Yeah, again, it, this is something that I talk about in my book. If your company really wants to have their head in the sand and really does not want to pay attention to the people who complain or leave uh, bad reviews for our app or whatever, then sometimes it's very hard to, uh, to wake people up when you can't find that impetus for change, which is usually we're losing customers, we're losing money, we're losing to competitors, people are returning this, people are uninstalling this. If you can't find that people are doing that, then you're just going to get leaders who pretend that everything's going better than it is because they don't want to face the truth. And, um, and, and the, the reality is they're also certainly not agile because agile would say, let's look at what we're doing and keep finding ways to be better. So this is probably also a company that doesn't care about being agile. If they did, you could try that angle. But yeah, we, we, we mentioned in the, in my book about, uh, my book, I don't know if anyone has read it yet. Customers know you suck. Sorry, I've changed my green screen to a blue screen. So now there's a bunch of see-through things on here. Um, and we talk about a story where a CEO of a well-known company that I don't name uh, couldn't believe the negative uh, reviews and comments they were getting because they were sure that those people were just complainers and they'd never say that to our faces. And sometimes what you have to do is find a way to get the customer to say that to someone's face, uh, to do those recorded interviews and to put those uh, video clip montages together. Maybe you spin up some research where you're going to talk to 10, 15 customers who your company identified as happy or left us a high score or stayed with us longer than six months, but then all of a sudden canceled. Talk to them about why they canceled, even a 15 minute video interview, and then make a video clip montage for people and say, hey, look, it's great that we have some happy customers and we have some happy reviews, but what are we doing about the ones that we lose? We, we, we managed to get them, we should be keeping them. Um, Puriko Ane, I don't know how to pronounce your name, I apologize, said, oops, uh, let me, oops, wrong button. Let's put up this question. And don't forget, we do uh, Ask Me Anythings every Tuesday on the other channel, CX-CC, uh, so make sure you're subscribed there. Um, says, how do you navigate changes from outside department in a UX mature company? You've got a UX mature company? Congratulations. I think you might be the only one I've ever met. Wow, where's my confetti? Um, how do you navigate changes in a UX mature company, documenting and writing any changes that aren't part of the testing phase, such as marketing wanting to change the color or wording? I don't understand this question. Are you asking me, how do you document changes? Oh, immature. Okay, oops, immature. So how do you document any changes? Document them, uh, however you want, spreadsheet, confluence, notion, uh, just start documenting, start anywhere, start with systems your company already uses, create documentations about, uh, about changes. Also, it sounds like you need to work with someone like marketing on what your process is. There might be a certain point at which marketing can't make changes anymore because this is what we're going with. So it sounds like you need to have some discussions with these people about process. And then as for documentation, uh, as long as documentation is being done, I'm not too hung up on what tool you use. You can use a Google Doc, um, but there you go. Maybe if everything is so good, you can try expand your product. It could be the option. I uh, don't didn't know what Karen was referring to. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm not totally sure about this documentation question. Um, okay, M says possibly unrelated. That's fine. This isn't ask me anything. Do you have any thoughts about writing about the things learned while working in UX as a way to review your own knowledge? And do you have advice on how to go about it? Um, yes, I think if you are writing, I think your intention is important. If you are writing to review your own knowledge, 
tell a story. When I first started trying to do this, I thought I had to do it this way. But because I was working at this type of company, I realized that didn't work. And I made some mistakes. And then I heard about this thing. I read this book. I watched this video. I learned about task analysis. And I figured I'm going to try this. So yes, you are reviewing your own knowledge. And maybe you might help somebody else. Uh, and then you have to decide where you want to put that writing. Is that your own blog? Is that Medium? Is that somewhere else? I'm not sure what you're asking. So I don't know if I'm going in the right direction on this answer. Um, my gong is going to go off in about 30 seconds to remind us to wind the show down. So other than M clarifying this, I think we probably don't have time for any more questions today. But remember, check the events calendar. We do this every Tuesday and always check the location field of the event because some things are on this channel, some things are on the other YouTube channel, and some things are webinars that we hold outside of YouTube that you can join live and then they're recorded and put on YouTube later. Um, so check the events calendar, add it to your calendar. You can add it to your Google, Outlook, iCal, uh, Apple, Apple calendar. Um, yeah, so M, uh, I'm hoping you'll clarify a little bit, but if not, we'll be winding the show down either way. I don't think I have a good way to end the show. It's just going to kind of fade out or stop abruptly. But uh, thanks again to the people who joined and hopefully the people who were part of the DIA program were able to join this live or will watch the recording later. Excuse me. <coughs> Ah, uh, oh, first time here. Thank you, Anmol. Yeah, I hope you will uh, join us. The Ask Me Anythings are our Tuesdays. Ooh, thank you for subscribing. Um, thanks from DIA. Great, great. I'm glad that you joined from DIA. Uh, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you too. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess we'll wind down our, our show here. Uh, reminder that uh, next uh, live event is uh, Tuesday. Yes, let's see. Tuesday is, of course, the Q&A AMA that I do on the CXCC YouTube channel. Make sure you sub you've subscribed there. And uh, that goes live at 3 p.m. Italy time. So three hours earlier than when we started today. It's nearly 7 p.m. Italy time now. So imagine in your time zone about four hours before wherever we are now. Uh, until clocks change. Then it'll be all messed up. Thank you, Hugo. Good to see you again. Um, again, I'll be doing this uh, on Tuesday, but without the slides and the pre-made content, just taking questions. Wednesday is that don't miss webinar on the new version of my quadrant exercise, an exercise that you can do on all of your projects. Um, and I want to teach people how to plan it and facilitate it and run with it. Is your book available on Amazon? Yes. Uh, Customers Know You Suck is available on Amazon. So you can go to cxto, sorry, cxcc.to slash c-k-y-s, all lowercase. And that's my webpage where you'll see all the places you can buy it. We also have the audiobook on the new YouTube channel. So the audiobook's totally free. It's read by me. And um, the website also has a PDF and EPUB version that you can buy for as little as $1. It's a name your own price. Or you can buy the uh, paperback or the hardcover from Amazon. This is the hardcover. Um, so thanks again. I am going to wrap up the show and uh, end the stream. Uh, again, thanks so much to our Patreon members, both the free ones who kind of join, it's like a mailing list, uh, and the paid ones who are getting special early access and other perks. I hope people will check out the Patreon. Uh, the paid memberships start at one American dollar each month. So not too bad in the scheme of things. Not adjusted for inflation. Thanks, Anmol. I hope to see everybody again on Tuesday. Have a super weekend, and I'm going to see if I can get the stream to stop. Bye!